Good evening. 6.07, perfect Harvard time. Before I formally kick off this year's Harvard Horizon Symposium, which is Force One, I have a confession to make. Thank you for your attention. When a research idea of mine is not working out, or when a decanal idea of mine is not being worked on, I find myself watching Harvard Horizon videos on YouTube. <laughs> the scholarly presentations are not only inspirational, but they are very therapeutic. The passion and the vigor displayed in those videos really energize me, so I could go on like an energizer bunny. But as I was watching this video again and again, which I did many times, I noticed a depressing correlation over the years. I found the more nervous rambling I was delivering these opening remarks, the larger the size of the shining spot on my head. <laughs> these are not very forgiving uh, lies. Um, being a well-trained statistician, particularly from GSS, I know how to turn correlation into causation. So I've decided to cut my talk, my remark this year, as short as possible in order to save some of my remaining hairs. And I thank President Faust and Provost Garber for helping me out because neither of them needs any introduction, so they won't get any. But I do want to take time, even at the risk of losing more hair, to thank three GSS alum, among many others, who really have made this symposium possible and successful. First and foremost is obviously Professor Hisa Kuriyama. Hisa. who, as far as I know, that got all his degrees from Harvard, we're very proud of that, and who really conceived this grand idea of Harvard Horizons. Of course, to turn a grand idea as such into a reality really takes a village. And for that, I really want to thank the tremendous help we got from the Box Center and the leadership of its director, Professor Robert Liu, another Harvard alum, GSS alum. So now we have the idea, we have the uh, human resource to do that, but we still need the money. And for that, I need to thank my classmate and occasional rival, if you don't know what I mean, watch last year's video, Professor St Stephen Blyce, for his financial contribution to make this program possible. Now, Professor Blyce cannot be here tonight because he's actually busy investing for Harvard, investing money for Harvard because he's also the president and the CEO of the uh, Harvard Management Company. And I know uh, this is a very stressful time, so my one piece of advice for him that if it's too stressful, watch some Harvard Horizon videos. <laughs> so now I'm ready to formally kick off this year's Harvard Horizon Symposium with two words, President Faust. Thank you for that elaborate, flattering, wonderful introduction. <laughs> I am very excited to be here. This is the first time I've been able to attend Harvard Horizons in person, though I have attended virtually with a video in past years. But as the reputation of this event has grown, I have felt left out by the exigencies of my schedule, which this year I structured in such a way that I was sure I would be able to be here and join you. And I wanted to do so for lots of reasons. One is because the videos are so terrific and I wanted to be present myself to see this year's presentations. But I also wanted to be here because what is happening here is such an important representation of what matters to this university. This is about 
discovery and what students have discovered. And it is about launching them into careers of discovery. It's also about dissemination of that knowledge. We say that we are about knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge at Harvard University. And there's a particular sort of that dissemination taking place here tonight, which is individuals sharing their discoveries with people outside their fields of inquiry and showing how the variety of what we do here at Harvard matters beyond the boundaries of any field or any discipline and is of interest and excitement and relevance to people far more broadly situated than in any particular discipline. And so this is Harvard speaking to the world. I'm sure that Zhao Li is not the only person who spends hours watching these videos. And so when you perform tonight, you are going into eternity on the internet and taking the message of why universities matter to a much larger world. So thank you to all of you who are about to present. Thank you to Zhao Li and his colleagues for making this possible. And thank you for inviting me to be here with you tonight. Thanks. Thank you, President Files, for putting the appropriate amount of pressure on all the scholars. <laughs> and uh, since I give the President such elaborate, kind introduction, I would give the same to our Provo Scarber. Thank you, Shali. Uh, let me add my welcome and my thanks to all the people who made this evening's event possible. This is, as Shali mentioned, the fourth of these Harvard Horizons events and every one of them has been a huge success. And as Drew was mentioning, this gets at the core of what we are as a university. Our PhD students represent our intellectual future as a university. If you're not in the field of one of our students, you don't get many opportunities to see what they're doing, to participate up close in the process of discovery that they undergo, that they drive forward. To see these young minds, well-trained, but continuing their training, tackle truly difficult, truly challenging problems. They work in libraries, in labs, in offices, in many, many different places throughout this campus. But to most of us, it's largely invisible. And even if we were present at the, se present at the seminars where they, where they present their work, we probably wouldn't understand it most of the time. So we get a rare glimpse in Harvard Horizons at the kind of the work that they're doing. And this is an opportunity for them to learn how to present their work to a broader public and for us to be stimulated and excited by what they do. Today, you will hear about the rhythm of prose and about the rhythm of gospel. You will learn about the structure of the virus that causes SARS and about the anatomy of decadence. This is a wonderful sample of the breadth of the intellectual activity that occurs in GSAS, and I have to add, I too am an alum of uh, GSAS and very proud of it. Uh, this is a rare opportunity for us to hear what's going on, and who knows, when you leave today's events, you may see the world in a different way. So welcome and thank you, and I wanna add my particular thanks to the next speaker, the person who really conceived of this, Hisa Koryama. Is everybody ready? I'd like to uh, invite our speakers to join me on the stage.
Now, all our scholars, all our scholars have worked very, very hard over the past few months uh, to prepare for this event. And they're ready. They're smiling. And they're bursting with ideas. But they're still a little bit nervous. So as I uh, introduce them, I'd like to ask you all to encourage each of them by your heartiest, your most enthusiastic uh, applause. So uh, presenting them in the order in which they'll be speaking, Phoebe De Vries, Earth and Planetary Science. Okay. Henry Bowles, Comparative Literature. Ariel White, Government. Cherise Barron, African African American Studies. <laughs> Carolina Salguero, Molecular and Cellular Biology. <laughs> uh, Chen Liu, East Asian Languages and Civilizations. Ashley Anderson, government. <laughs> Thomas Wisniewski, comparative literature. So without further ado, we'll move on to our first speaker, Phoebe DeVries. The 1999 Izmit earthquake killed more than 17,000 people. All told, this was one of the most devastating seismic events in the world in the past two decades. For some geographical context, this is a view of Turkey from space. And the Izmit earthquake took place where the red dot is. This earthquake happened on a long fault called the North Anatolian Fault that's similar in many ways to the San Andreas Fault in California. As devastating as this 1999 earthquake was, it was by no means the largest earthquake that Turkey has experienced over the last century. In fact, it was just the most recent in a series of earthquakes since 1939. And as you watch this sequence of earthquakes, one of the most remarkable things about them is that they seem to be moving westward over time. And when you see something like this, the natural question is, well, what's next and where? Well, just extending this pattern in time and space, we might expect the next one to occur somewhere to the west of the 1999 earthquake. This has gotten a lot of attention because Istanbul, a city of more than 14 million people, is less than 50 kilometers from this part of the fault. And so in our research group, one of the questions that we're really trying to get at is, are these earthquakes somehow triggering one another? And if so, how? How could they be triggering one another when they're happening years to decades apart, and in some cases, hundreds of kilometers apart? What is the mechanism that could explain this? And if there is a mechanism that could explain this, what would it tell us about when we might expect the next earthquake to occur? Well, one mechanism that may be able to explain this is the behavior of the lower crust of the Earth. And when I say lower crust, I mean the crust beneath about 10 to 20 kilometers depth. So beneath the depth of most continental earthquakes. 
And specifically, the lower crust might behave as both a fluid and as a solid. There's a very familiar material that acts like this, silly putty. If you hit it with a hammer, it acts like a solid. But if you knead it and deform it more slowly, it flows much more like a fluid. In the same way, when an earthquake happens in the upper crust, it stresses the upper crust around it and the lower crust beneath it. But then over years to decades after the earthquake, the lower crust might be able to flow um, in response to those earthquake stresses. So this is a mechanism that could explain why years to decades after one earthquake, another earthquake is triggered because the crust may be still adjusting to that first earthquake long after it happens. And so in my PhD, I spent three years working on a computational code to calculate the changes in the crust over time and the stress evolution in the crust over time after large earthquakes. And with this code, we can now look at what effect each of these earthquakes in Turkey may have had on the next one in the sequence due to the effects of a lower crust. So again, here is Turkey with Istanbul and the North Anatolian Fault. And we can make this map grayscale and then rotate our view down to look along the fault. This is now immediately after the 1939 earthquake. So the red parts of the fault highlight the parts of the fault that have already ruptured. And the yellow dot highlights the location of the next earthquake in the sequence. In this case, the 1942 earthquake. And as you watch the time-dependent stresses evolve up until the day before the 1942 earthquake, you can see that now, at the location of this next earthquake, the yellow dot, the time-dependent stress is red or increased. And as you watch the rest of the sequence of earthquakes, a similar story is true for each of the other events. That is, based on these model calculations, it seems like the time-dependent effects of the past earthquakes may be promoting the occurrence of the future earthquakes. And in fact, we can infer, based on the median time-dependent stress threshold at which these past earthquakes have occurred, that the part of the fault closest to Istanbul may reach this median threshold between 2015 and 2032. So overall, with these kinds of calculations, we're trying to understand stress evolution and earthquake interactions, not just in Turkey, but around the world. This is a heat map of population density worldwide. So the brightest areas represent the most densely populated areas. Overlaid now on top are the world's most active fault zones. Over 15% of the world's population lives close to these active faults. And as you've seen here in our research group, we study not just what happens across these faults during earthquakes, but also what happens across them between earthquakes. It might seem counterintuitive to focus on this because it's the earthquakes that cause the damage, but understanding what happens across these faults between earthquakes might be key to trying to answer the most important question for the hundreds of millions of people who live close to these active faults today. Not just where these large earthquakes are going to occur, but when. Must literature be ethical? Must it be useful? To answer no to these questions is to push back against the entirety of the tradition, justifying the canon, the great Western works, the humanities even, in American education since the 1980s. More fundamentally, a non-ethical, non-utilitarian literature pushes against the whole of the tradition justifying the literature, literature in human life since antiquity. Plato in The Republic says that if the young guardians must be exposed to fiction, it should at least be toward moral ends. I speak to you this evening as a scholar of Arabic, Persian, Greek, and Latin. And what I have learned in the course of my doctoral work is that each of these languages possesses a literary tradition entirely unconcerned with learning, with usefulness, or with ethics. 
These are literatures which have been called, at once by modern observers and by observers at the time, decadent. It is the coalescence of these two disapproving perspectives that has led these literatures to be essentially effaced from the historical record. Decadence comes from Latin, decadare. It's a late medieval Latin coinage. It means to fall down. But what does it mean to call a literature decadent? To answer this question, I have looked at what critics at the time in each of these four languages have to say about putative literary decline. I look at 5th century BC Athens, 2nd century CE Rome, 9th century CE Baghdad, 17th century Isfahan in modern day Iran. What becomes clear is that despite these separations in language, space, and time, critics perceive literature as declining, as breaking away from the ethical and utilitarian in much the same fashion. Something like an anatomy of decadence takes shape. This anatomy has three facets, the elevation of form over function, the spread of seemingly illogical metaphor, and the elevation of the imagination at nature's expense. The first facet in this anatomy of decadence is a literature ostensibly more concerned with how it looks and sounds than with what it means. A 10th century Arabic critic will lament the poetry of one of his contemporaries for being the product of a master of artifice, someone who's mannered in the extreme, someone who perverts language and meaning because he abuses figures of speech which manipulate sight and sound. In so doing, he breaks away from the way of the ancients, content as the ancients had been to use these figures sparingly in order to use the poem to present a limpid or transparent window onto the natural world. We can then move back in time and to the West, to a Greek critic writing under Roman rule in the second century CE, summarizing the critical consensus on the spread of what were then very fashionable technologies of discourse, this being the second sophistic. These technologies, again, are figures of speech manipulating sight and sound, reducing supposedly the otherwise beautiful works of nature to lifeless skeletons. This is part then of a broader move from text to image, from function to form, from meaning to decoration. In the extreme, the poem itself will become a kind of glorified calligraphy. In the Arabic and Persian case, these are two languages whose classical literatures are narrative in content, verse in form. Over time, this will yield to short lyric poems in the shape of birds, trees, and eggs. Objects so decorative, they could be affixed to a wall. The second facet to this anatomy of decadence is the spread of seemingly illogical, seemingly unjustifiable metaphor. A 17th century Persian poet will write desiring the full embrace of that beautiful figure, all of the flowers have become bosoms and arms. In this line, the fantastic metamorphosis, the wild causation, the displaced affect onto nature, all of this for critics was at once unjustifiable and the hallmark of decadent description. The third and final facet to this anatomy of decadence pertains to the author, to the individual. That is, critics see a writer less concerned with how the natural world strikes his or her physical eyes than with how it strikes and can be manipulated by his or her mind's eye. This is the imagination's ascent over nature. A second century Roman historian will lament a language that is a mirror of a dissolution of morals, a mirror more fundamentally, of a language that has been reduced to a tool for human profiteering. This goes hand in hand with an imagination more and more intent on reducing the natural world to a shadow of its own desire. A paradox, finally. I'm asking us to study literatures that are unconcerned with learning and usefulness in order that we ourselves might learn something useful. First, our modern bias toward an ethical and utilitarian literature, a literature that will teach us about the world, how to live, how to unearth structures of oppression, together with the fact that this has been a bias more or less shared by critics across time, shouldn't blind us to the fact that in practice, much literature is not so concerned. Second conclusion, and this is why we're looking at Duchamp's path-breaking modern, modern masterpiece, The Urinal. Every facet to the anatomy of decadence, form over function, artificial syntheses of nature, inflated imagination, all of this should be familiar to us. 
This is the stuff of modernism. It's the stuff of aesthetics in the West and now the world over since the 19th century. Modernism then may simply be decadence by another name. Or modernism happens when aesthetic developments historically taboo become accepted. In that case, the history of decadence may in fact be the secret history of modernism. we send a lot of people to jail. Something like 11 million people pass through our local jails every year. This means that as a society, we're doing a sort of balancing act where we're implicitly weighing the perceived social benefits of these jail terms against the social and the individual costs that we see. What does jail time mean for someone's job prospect, for their family, for their engagement in the community, and so on. My work as a political scientist aims to measure another effect of jail sentencing, and that's on political participation. I've been asking whether sending people to jail, even for short periods for relatively minor crimes, can make them less likely to vote in future elections. And further, I've been asking whether jail matters differently across race, given the very different incarceration rates we see for white and non-white Americans. Now, I'm not talking here about people who have been legally disenfranchised because of a felony conviction. I'm talking about people who have spent a few days or weeks behind bars over a misdemeanor crime, something like uh, drug possession or shoplifting, and who then stop voting either because their view of government has been dramatically changed by the experience or because their life circumstances have been so changed that voting falls by the wayside. So I've been asking how often people stop voting because of these short jail terms. But how do you study something like that? We could start by comparing voting rates among people who have been to jail and those who haven't. But you might already be thinking, people who get sent to jail differ from those who don't in a variety of ways, right? So how do we know that jail is what's causing the difference in voting rates and not education or income or any number of other things? And social scientists have tools to deal with problems like this. If we want to know whether a particular campaign flyer works, for example, to get people to vote, we can run an experiment. We can randomly assign some households to receive a flyer in the mail and others not. And then we can see whether these otherwise comparable groups behave differently in the next election. We can see whether the flyer worked. But in cases where we can't run actual experiments, Sometimes we have to get creative and look for a natural variation out in the world. That's what I've done here. I focus on one county with a particular court structure. In this case, people who are charged with misdemeanor crimes are randomly assigned to one of 15 different courtrooms that could hear their case. And these courtrooms and the judges that sit within them differ a lot in how often they sentence people to jail. This means that if two identical people walked into the courthouse on the same day, charged with the same thing, but they got sent to different courtrooms, one of them could conceivably walk free while the other one gets sent to jail simply because of this assignment mechanism. So you see how this feels a little bit like the experiment I just mentioned, right? There's a part of people's jail sentencing that's being driven not by their personal characteristics, but by chance, by the luck of the draw. And this is surprising, and it's interesting on its own. But it's also going to help me answer the question of how jail affects voting, because now there's this random component to jail sentencing that I can use kind of like experimental data. So once we've worked out this research design, what do we find? Well, going to jail does make people less likely to vote. I find about a four percentage point drop overall. But it's not the same across the board. White defendants show no demobilization. They keep voting at the same rates, regardless of jail sentences. But black defendants who are sent to jail become 13 percentage points less likely to vote. Think of moving from 24% voter turnout down to just 11% of people voting. 
And this translates into thousands of black voters staying home from the polls in just this county in a given election year. But why do we see these stark differences in the effect of jail on voting? Well, at least partly because of differences in who gets arrested and charged with these kinds of crimes in the first place. When I look back at public records, I find that white defendants in these courtrooms were generally not voting even before they were arrested. Only a very small proportion of them had voted in the last presidential election, for example. And if you weren't voting before you went to jail, there's not a lot of room to stop voting afterwards. So we don't see an effect here. There's no demobilization happening. But there's also a lot of evidence, when we look at black defendants, that African Americans disproportionately face police scrutiny and risk of arrest. And so, with more people being arrested, come more and different people being pulled into the courtrooms. And with more voters in the courtroom, which is one thing that we see, um, black defendants were nearly twice as likely as white defendants to have been voters before they got arrested. They had voted at almost twice the rate in the last election. With more voters in the courtroom come more opportunity to stop voting after you've been sent to jail. So there's much more room to see this big demobilization effect. So you've seen that jail can deter people from voting and that it disproportionately discourages black voters from going to the polls. And this is an important story at the individual level. But at the neighborhood level, it could be even more politically significant because we know that arrests and jail sentences aren't evenly distributed across geographic areas. They're clustered. And so if people are leaving the electorate due to jail, this will translate into lower voter turnout in some neighborhoods, disproportionately in minority neighborhoods. And ultimately, this could mean that the neighborhoods that are most directly affected by our current criminal justice policies are also the least likely to have politicians' attention when it comes to setting those policies going forward. Incarceration could be building a cycle of community disenfranchisement. Thank you. Gospel music is Christian music that employs popular and folk music forms to praise God, reinforce Christian texts and principles, or facilitate encounter with God. As a scholar of African Americana, religion, and ethnomusicology, or the study of music and its culture, I study black gospel music, or gospel music primarily performed by black Americans. Now, when most people think of black gospel music, they probably envision a choir in a church, and the choir members are wearing robes, they're swaying from side to side and clapping their hands as they boisterously sing. Were you thinking of something like that? Well, since the 1990s, gospel music could just as easily look like gospel artist Kirk Franklin and his group of singers sporting urban casual wear, doing hip hop dance moves, and singing about the return of Christ as the coming of a revolution. I've studied the work of Kirk Franklin, and I have interviewed and observed a myriad of gospel artists, industry insiders, preachers, and pastors. I've also poured over countless recordings, stacks of magazines, volumes of performance footage, and some 30,000 entries in the recording industry's sales certification database. My research shows that the performance practices and sales successes of artists like Kirk Franklin are so different from what came before 
that they represent an entirely new era in gospel. I call this new time period, beginning in 1993, the platinum age of gospel. I know. <laughs> I've dubbed this period the platinum age to recognize succession from gospel's golden age and to acknowledge consumers' increased acceptance of a more commercialized representation of gospel. During the Platinum Age, a number of the national black gospel artists worked very hard to incorporate popular culture, not just in their music and lyrics, but also in their fashion, their rhetoric, and their performance styles. I know it's very easy to say this is nothing but a marketing ploy and a watering down of real gospel just to garner mainstream sales. But beyond the, in the increased commercialization, something else is happening. Gospel artists were actually responding to a significant theological shift that had taken place among the leaders of prominent black churches. Now my use of the term piety is what I use to describe the vast network of behaviors and practices that signal devotion to God. And historically, gospel artists were expected to display their piety. And they were to display this piety by their conspicuous adherence to various prohibitions enforced by the leaders of these prominent black churches. Well, by the Platinum Age, many of the leaders had relaxed a great number of these prohibitions, especially restrictions against integration with contemporary culture. So in the Platinum Age, gospel artists could collaborate with pop stars, make movies, record romantic songs, and even wear trendy body-conscious clothing and still enjoy access to prominent black church platforms. Well, the consumers responded favorably as well. During the Platinum Age, no less than 24 different black gospel recordings achieved platinum sales, or sales of at least a million units. Now, before the Platinum Age, it was rare for a gospel artist, a black gospel artist, to achieve platinum sales. So 24 different platinum selling projects in the 20 year period between 93 and 2013 is staggering. Now today, gospel artists continue to employ various aspects of popular culture in their music and performances, but sales have declined. This can easily be attributed to consumers moving to streaming content and to music, the music industry retracting support for new artists and new projects. As the music industry continues to adjust to the phenomenon of streaming content, one thing about gospel music remains certain. Gospel music has, and it will continue, to provide markers of social and theological change among black American Christians. So when you think about gospel music, remember, gospel comes in a myriad of forms. And gospel music is not just entertainment, but gospel is a window into the world of black American Christianity. I am extremely grateful to be here today. This talk is dedicated to all the young Latinos and Latinas out there who dream of becoming scientists, to those who want to use research as a tool to cause social impact. I want to encourage you all to dream big, to do what you love, and to follow your passion wherever that may take you. Most people perceive viruses as silent, invisible killers. 
that cause epidemics and pandemics worldwide. Yet viruses are only invisible to the naked eye. Advances in microscopy have allowed us to observe what viruses look like in three dimensions. But if we want to dig in, if we want to visualize the details of the components of viruses, we have to open up our toolbox and combine virology with biochemistry, biophysics, and all the techniques in structural biology. Over time, we have learned that viruses are composed of the same building blocks of living cells. But unlike cells that use their proteins to perform all the functions that either keep a cell alive or eliminate a cell that is sick, viruses use their proteins to hijack the cellular machinery so they can reproduce themselves and continue infecting other cells. So it's no surprise that viral proteins are the current targets of our antiviral therapies. However, viruses like HIV are capable of modifying these proteins over time, which can cause patients that are in single antiviral therapies to become resistant to treatment. So scientists have begun looking for an alternative target, something that is so essential to the survival of the virus that it cannot change rapidly over time. And that could be RNA. RNA is like the cousin of DNA. They're both made out of similar building blocks. They both carry genetic information. But for the most part, RNA is like a message from DNA that has been translated in a language that the cellular machinery can read to produce a protein. But what's important here, what makes RNA an alternative target for antiviral therapies is its structure. Unlike DNA, which is only found in double-stranded helices, RNA has the ability of folding itself into complex structures, and these structures themselves perform functions that are essential for the cell. So some viruses have up taking RNA as their genetic material and use it not only to carry their genetic information, but also to use the structures within to co-opt the machinery of the cell. It's been known that some viruses that use RNA as their genetic material produce a specific ratio of proteins. And maintaining this ratio is absolutely essential for the survival of these viruses. It was also known that there was a piece of RNA that had the potential of folding into a knotted structure. And this piece somehow regulated this ratio. What we didn't really know was exactly how. And that's exactly what I've been doing during my PhD. I've been using a combination of structural and functional approaches to understand not only what this structure looks like in three dimensions, but how is it that its structure determines its function. The structural approach that we use in our lab is called nuclear magnetic resonance. And this tool allows us to obtain atomic information so we can create three-dimensional models of how molecules look like in solution. In order to understand the relationship between structure and function, I use something that we call structural guided mutagenesis. And what that means is that I change different regions within the knot structure to understand this function. I want to know what the contribution of that region is to the overall function. So by studying two different viruses, viruses that belong to very different families, a coronavirus that infects humans and has caused epidemics, and a retrovirus that infects mice but is used as a model system to study HIV, we observe that these knotted structures are actually found in a dynamic equilibrium between two states, and that each of these states has a particular three-dimensional structure. We also observe that these states are not found at equal proportions. One of them is found at a minority of the population. In the case of the retrovirus, it's somewhere around 5%. In the case of the coronavirus, it's more like 15%. But what was really striking for us is that these percentages correlate to the relative quantity of proteins that are produced. And so what that meant for us is that the state in which the RNA is found determines its function. For example, if the cellular machinery encounters the first state, the cells are going to produce one set of proteins. But if it encounters that alternate state, 
that state is somehow going to trick the cellular machinery into producing an extra set of proteins. And those proteins are necessary for the virus to create a new viral particle that can then go ahead and infect other cells. So by splitting the percentages or partitioning the amounts of the two states that are found within the cell, the virus can obtain a specific ratio of proteins. If we're capable of finding molecules that target this knotted structure, we will be able to create drugs that decrease infectivity. The results of my PhD are now the results that are the basis for a project in our lab that is trying to understand how this process functions in HIV. And it is our hope that in the near future, the results of our work will lead to the development of a new generation of antiviral therapies that can decrease infectivity and better the lives of people around the world. I notice that some of you are jotting down notes on the brochure or on your phones, or where you're texting. <laughs> what are you going to do with these notes later? Throw away, turn into a diary, a tweet, or just forget? How long are they going to last? Who will be reading them in five or 50 years? As a scholar of Chinese literature, I was struck when I found out that a large body of marginalia from the Song Dynasty, similar to our notes tonight, has been preserved. These 17,000 pieces of marginalia make up, ten, make up of 10% of all the extant prose literature preserved from this period. How did that happen? First, some background information. By marginalia, I'm referring to a wide range of miscellaneous prose or jottings that are often short, personal, and informal. Main categories include personal letters, anecdotes, and marginal notes. And here are some examples of marginal notes. Luckily, we still have dozens of them in the original manuscript form. This 8th century painting was originally clean. Gradually, readers and collectors inscribed notes and put seals on it, a practice that continued for a thousand years until it was put behind the glass window of Metropolitan Museum. For calligraphy, Later readers attached pieces of paper at the end or even at the beginning of the original piece and wrote colorful marginal notes on it, making it into a scroll that keeps on growing. We can see the boundaries of these added pieces of paper vary in colors, sizes, and texture, marked by the seals of the authors of marginal notes. It is understandable that marginalia like these were preserved because they became part of precious paintings and calligraphy. But the rest tens of thousands of marginalia exist today because they have been collected and printed as part of literary collections in 12th century China. Therefore, the real question I explore in my dissertation is, how did marginalia become literature in 12th century China. To answer this, let us look at one note in detail. I paraphrased parts of it. My friend is good at calligraphy, and he has a bag filled with delicate brushes and ink sticks given by people who wanted his writing. One day, I found half a stick of very precious ink and wanted it. He felt reluctant, but I snatched it anyway. It is this very ink that I'm writing with now. 
pay attention to the last line. By highlighting the ink he was using, the author, Su Shi, made this piece a vignette of the very moment of his composition. And here lies the most important reason of 12th century people's fascination with marginalia. They are self-referential and remind the readers of the vivid details of the moment of writing, be it the pattern of the paper, the quality of the ink, or the way the author waves his brush. Such features of these kinds of notes create an intimate bond between the reader and the author of the previous era. And such a bond was especially important for readers of the early and mid 12th century. A key author, Su Shi, had been censored, which made his writings even more coveted. Additionally, in 1120s, the Song Dynasty lost most of its land north of the Yangtze River, and the imperial court fled to the south. In the wake of the loss of the northern capital, these marginalia served as nostalgic mementos of the glorious literary, literary culture of the lost north. These factors, coupled with fierce competition among publishers to produce the most complete literary collections in print, led to the flourishing of marginalia culture and their establishment as new literary genres. Now, why is the story of marginalia from 800 years ago important for us? First, it reminds us that literary categories are constantly shifting. Literary values and even the very definition of literature were formed in specific historical context. Concepts and objects often gained new value and meanings that were drastically different from what was conceived for them. And it is these values as recognized and projected by later people that made them last. But ultimately, this is a story about what is ephemeral and what is long-lasting. These marginalia survived because 12th century people appreciated the value of their transience. With this in mind, you may want to pause a second when you throw away your notes or post something to the cloud. Sometimes ephemeral words outlive us. was a watershed moment in Tunisian politics. That year, the country's nearly 60-year dictatorship came to an abrupt end in the wake of a wave of civil unrest, now commonly known as the Arab Spring. Yet the success of Tunisia's Arab Spring hinged on an unlikely actor, labor unions. By organizing strikes across the country that highlighted the political and economic corruption of the regime, Labor unions transformed what began as a series of local protests into a nationwide movement opposing authoritarian rule, with workers and citizens across the country calling for the end to the Ben Ali regime. Now, months later in Morocco, the regime faced a strikingly similar situation. As in Tunisia, citizens had begun a protest movement calling for a solution to the country's economic crisis and a host of democratic reforms to the regime. Yet in contrast to Tunisia, Moroccan unions remained relatively distant from these demands. As one unionist, pictured in the May Day demonstrations above put it, we are marching because we wish to push for a social agenda that has nothing to do with the political agenda of the pro-democracy movement. Now, as a political scientist hearing about these two scenarios, I found myself puzzled. I mean, here we had two countries with seemingly similar economic crises, one in which a union champions a protest movement that outs a dictator, and another 
in which unions stand idly by in the background and the status quo prevails. And it's this stark dichotomy that presented me with the question that is at the heart of my presentation to you today. Why, in authoritarian regimes, do some unions choose to engage in anti-regime protests while others do not? And more important, what does this engagement mean for the success of pro-democracy movements writ large? Now, in attempting to answer this first question, I considered a number of different explanations. I looked at differences in unions' organizational features and their economic grievances and their structural conditions, all of which seemed to suggest that Tunisian and Moroccan unions were actually much more similar than they were different. And so then I turned to the lessons of my discipline, and I considered whether there might be any political explanations that could account for differences in Moroccan and Tunisian unions' protest behavior. In particular, I wondered if there was any connection between a union's level of, of embeddedness within the political institutions of the state and their willingness to protest against it. The logic here is rather simple. The more incorporated a union was within the state apparatus, I believed, the less willing it should be to want to protest against the leaders of that state in the future. Yet while this concept is theoretically straightforward, the task of finding empirical evidence that would allow me to measure unions' political kinetic connectedness to the state was actually much more difficult. To do this, I poured through hundreds of thousands of microfilms, of government documents, of newspaper articles, and elections material, and I also, also traveled to Tunisia and Morocco for about 18 months to conduct 120 interviews um, in order to uncover any informal relationships between unions and the state that might not have appeared in the official press. And what I found is that there were actually very stark differences between Moroccan and Tunisian unions in terms of their level of incorporation within the state. In particular, I found that Moroccan unionists occupied at least 10% more parliamentary seats, held five more high-ranking government appointments, and at least 20% more top party leadership positions than their Tunisian counterparts, making them much more deeply embedded within the state apparatus. But how do these political appointments actually affect unions' protest behavior? Well, I argue that it does so in two ways. First, political positions serve as one way of financially tying unions to the regime, making them much more reluctant to openly oppose it. As the proverb goes, you should not bite the hand that feeds you. And in Morocco, the hand that feeds organized labor is the state, both metaphorically and literally. A Moroccan unionist serving in parliament, for example, stands to make up to nine times the amount of the average Moroccan citizen, a portion of which gets paid directly to the union as a subsidy. By contrast, in Tunisia, where unionists make up less than 1% of all seats in government, unions must rely almost exclusively on dues paid by their members to remain financially solvent. And this brings me to the second reason why unions' political networks so critically affect their protest behavior. Tied to the regime through these networks of privilege and prestige, Moroccan unions effectively become clients of the regime and thus fail to perform their intended functions as representatives of their members. As statistics on their leadership activities show, they use their heightened political capital to remain in office nearly five times the amount of Tunisian unionists and they are consistently rated as ruling in a less democratic fashion than their Tunisian counterparts. As a result of this lack of democratic accountability, Moroccan union leaders often fail to support the militant actions of their members, leading movements that begin at the base, such as the one pictured here in 2011 did, to languish and eventually die out. By contrast, in Tunisia, where union leaders are much more beholden to the wishes of their members, Protest movements with inauspicious beginnings can evolve and eventually expand into national movements for political change. Now, in closing this presentation, I want to address the lingering question here. What can the cases of Tunisia and Morocco actually tell us about political developments in the larger world? Well, I want to argue that the cases discussed here speak to a broader connection between labor unions and political democracy that we see replicated throughout the globe. Not only, as I have shown you here, do unions with more autonomy from the state serve as more democratic representatives of their members, but they can also better serve to enhance democracy and the regime writ large. As the experiences of several countries, Poland, South Korea, South Africa, Brazil, and others show, where unions become involved in anti-regime protest, dictators typically fall, paving the way for the consolidation of successful democracies. By contrast, where they do not, 
autocracies often survive and endure. Thus, if we are concerned with enhancing global democracy, I argue that we should be particularly attuned to the behavior of labor organizations, as these may be the secret key of success for pro-democracy movements around the globe. Rhythm, two syllables, strong, weak. In prosody, which is a study of rhythm in language and literature, the word is what we call a troche, stressed, unstressed. Now, if I were to repeat this word in succession, rhythm, 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 I would establish a pulse or a beat or a groove or what we call in music and poetry, a meter. The word rhythm comes to us from the Greek, rhythmos, meaning measured flow, repetition in time or space of an action, or regular repeated pattern of sound or movement. And this idea of flow, of alternation, repetition, and pattern is central to understanding how rhythm works in language and in the world. Rhythm is familiar to us because rhythm is body. Any action we perform with any degree of regularity produces rhythm. When we walk, when we run, when we sing, when we dance, when we swim, when we ride a bike, when we breathe, when we dream, we do so rhythmically. Alternation, pattern, flow. Rhythm is intrinsic to all of the arts and flows across the arts, including the three forms that I specialize in, literature, music, and dance. As a comparatist, I work across languages and cultures and media. And as a scholar of the comparative arts, what unites all that I do is the study of rhythm. The steps of a dance, the meter of a song, and the rhythm of a poem all perform rhythm. When we think of rhythm in language, we return to some of our earliest experiences of language, a lullaby, for example. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. There, too, we have a trochee strong weak, twinkle, and four beats or four feet in a meter called trochaic tetrameter. When we think of rhythm in literature, we think of poetry. Shakespeare, for example, sonnet 73, one of his best. The first quatrain reads, that time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves, or none, or few, do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs, where late the sweet birds sang. The meter there is the opposite of trochaic, iambic, weak, strong, and we have not four beats, but five in a meter called iambic pentameter. Repetition, meter, rhyme, and therefore rhythm. T.S. Eliot had the idea that a poem or a passage of a poem may tend to realize itself first as a particular rhythm before it reaches expression in words. He's speaking here about the creative process of composition, but speaking, too, to the idea of poetry as a vocal art, the idea that the poem is a score for voice and that a poem has two lives, one on the page, one when read aloud. How else to read poetry but syllable by syllable, word by word, line by line? And when we read poetry, we pay an intense attention to its rhythm. But what about the rhythm of prose? Why, when it comes to prose, so we do almost the opposite. We scan prose visually, superficially, for information, for content, for idea, without paying any attention really at all to the sound that the words make and the rhythm that those words produce. Is prose somehow inferior to poetry? Well, the poet Coleridge certainly thought so. He says, I wish our clever young poets would remember my homely definitions of prose and poetry. That is, Prose is words in their best order. Poetry, the best words in the best order. <laughs> now, if that's true and prose isn't the best words, it follows that it really makes no sense to pay attention to the rhythm of those words. But prose, even badly written, has a rhythm, 
And I would agree with A.M. Bell when he says that in every sentence, however uttered, there is a rhythm. There's a rhythm in that sentence, in the sentence I'm saying now, and the sentence I'm yet to speak. Prose, although predominantly non-metrical, is never non-rhythmical. The rhythm of prose is more varied and regular, and less regular than that of poetry, but no less present. An absence of meter does not mean an absence of rhythm. Now, writers and philosophers from antiquity, from Aristotle and Cicero to the present day, Amy Hempel and Lydia Davis, have all remarked upon the significance of the rhythm of prose. But it is really the master prose stylist of the mid to late 19th and early 20th century, the modernists, those virtuosic writers whom I've chosen to study in my doctoral work, who captured and harnessed and exploited the power of prose rhythm in the novel. Gustave Flaubert, as he was writing Madame Bovary, spoke of hearing pre-verbal rhythms. He believed that a passage of prose should be just as sonorous, just as rhythmic as any line of poetry. Virginia Woolf, as she was writing one of her most experimental novels, The Waves, said that she was writing not to a plot, but to a rhythm. That she was writing prose, yet poetry, collapsing that binary distinction or opposition between prose and poetry that the modernists successfully and forever did away with. An example from her earlier novel, To the Lighthouse, when Wolf has her protagonist, Mrs. Ramsey, put the children to bed, Wolf does not write as a lesser stylist might have, she closed the door. Wolf allows us to hear the door being closed, she writes, and let the tongue of the door slowly lengthen in the lock, a phrase that performs acoustically the seemingly prosaic action it describes. James Joyce, as he was writing his first book of fiction, Dubliners, would read aloud the stories to his friend Italo Svevo, the Italian writer in Trieste, including the novella that closes that collection, The Dead, which contains some of the most exquisite prose ever written in the English language. As Joyce was writing Ulysses, the Oxen of the Sun episode of Ulysses, he was reading George Sainsbury's A History of English Prose Rhythm, 1912. Now, I mentioned Joyce, Sainsbury, and reading aloud because I believe if we're serious about studying the rhythm of prose, we have to be serious about studying orality, which means working not only from texts, but from performances and recordings of texts and transcriptions of those recordings. This is a challenge to prosody as traditionally practiced, which assumes that there's a single scansion of a poem or passage of prose, a definitive reading. I'd like to close with an example from one of my case studies on the work of the Danish writer Karen Blixen. Blixen considered herself a kind of modern Scheherazade. She was famous for reading her work aloud on the radio and on tour, including the 1959 tour she made to America when she visited Radcliffe. On that occasion, she read from her first book of fiction, Seven Gothic Tales, an excerpt entitled The Wine of the Tetrarch. And here we have the very last passage from that excerpt. And I'll visualize for you some of the rhetorical rhythmical effects in the prose, including alliteration and anaphora, repetition and parallelism. Visualizing the text tells us something. But the eye alone cannot tell us all that we need to know when it comes to rhythm. So I'd like to take a short excerpt of that passage and have you listen to a recording of Blixen performing that text. As you listen, focus your attention on the grain of her voice, on the cadence of her sentences, on the breath and pause she makes between those sentences, on the crescendo and emphasis she places on the obvious repetitions of the monosyllable name and the proper noun Barabbas, a dactyl, strong, weak, weak. And in so doing, I think you'll have an embodied experience of rhythm. So here is Blixen from an archival 1959 recording kept in the Woodbury Poetry Room. My name, he said. Do you not know my name? My name was cried out on Friday last all over Jerusalem. Barabbas, they cried. Barabbas, give us Barabbas. 
My name is Barabbas. That name will be remembered. With these words, he walked away. Hearing Blixen read that passage aloud makes rhythm audible and draws the attention of our ears to the acoustics of her voice and the rhythm of her prose, otherwise overlooked by the eye and forgotten on the page. An attention to rhythm is an attention to beauty. Thank you. As I was listening to all the presentations, I realized these presentations are not only inspirational, therapeutic, but also earth-shattering. I hope you still remember the first one. <laughs> now I have my great pleasure to introduce Dean Smith. Now I don't suggest Dean Smith needs more introduction than President Faust and um, Provost Garber, but I do need to say a few words about what a task that Dean Smith is given, and uh, uh, because this is a, not an easy task. See, the purpose of this type of presentation is really trying to um, convey these uh, great research to non-experts, and uh, um, but there's one particular person really needs to understand all of those, which is the Dean of Arts, Dean of a Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Whoever in that position needs to make all these decisions. And uh, so I think it's a real test. We will see that uh, how much you have done to really uh, convey that he can summarize, summarize well. So, and uh, after that, we will be able to applaud you because we still have this real test. So uh, Dean Smith. So this is an example of doing it on the fly. So uh, Jelly has me kind of give me a little bit of an introduction on what he thinks I'm going to do. And then, of course, I just completely change it, uh, especially after what the president and provost said before me. So I'll incorporate a little, but I'm not going to do all the summaries that you may have heard him say. Let me, first of all, just add my thanks to Jali and to Hisa for the amazing job that they've done here. Hisa, of course, for his incredible efforts and his vision that has made what many of us thought was a fantastic idea into a reality that is affecting so many people. And then of course my thanks to Zhao Li for his leadership of the graduate school, but most importantly for his efforts behind professional development of our graduate students. He's having a real impact on lives by doing this. So thank you both very much for that. So now, of course, let me thank the current and horizon scholars here. As you heard, you are the fourth class, but those were first class presentations. So thank you very much for that. So I, I couldn't help but sitting there listening and wondering if you all had learned what I had learned through my time as being dean here, that this is a big stage where am I supposed to stand? Am I walking around enough? Am I where I'm supposed to be? All kinds of questions flashed through my mind when I'm up here. I thought each of you did fantastic. I can't help but saying here at the beginning of baseball season that each of you hit a home run. What a fantastic way to start a career. And I look forward to so much more of what you do throughout your time. I want to echo a little bit that you heard also from our president, and that's that Scholarship is not just about the discovery and generation of new knowledge, but it, it's really also importantly about the communication of the power of ideas. In my own experience, I found that knowledge production is absolutely enhanced by community. First and foremost, by the community of scholars that you work with who understand your research in great depth, 
But as you saw today, we can find surprising extensions to those ideas, new applications of those ideas, as we think about how we should explain and promote our ideas with others that are not necessarily in our own fields. And I think that became extremely obvious to me as I was listening to one of these talks, as your ideas become, as Chen said, the scroll that keeps on growing. As you are interacting with others, they're adding their own notes, marginalia, to the ideas that you began with. And out of it becomes something that's beautiful and hugely impactful across the world. So thank you all for everything that you did there. Congratulations on a fantastic program for us. And it's my great pleasure now to invite back our Harvard Horizon scholar, Sharice Barron, to, I hope, get us up on our feet again. Maybe a little singing along with it? No? Yes? Thank you all. Thank you, Dean Smith. I'm not here to make you sing, but I'm here to thank you and to also tell you about our journey to tonight. First, uh, on behalf of the 2016 cohort of Harvard Horizon Scholars, I would like to say thank you to Dean Mung, to Dean Thomas, Sheila Thomas, and to Professor Kuriyama, and to all of the Harvard Horizons Committee that made this such uh, a marvelous opportunity for us all. We would also like to collectively thank the Harvard Horizons faculty fellows who advised us, who advised us, and the Box Center mentoring team, namely Sarah Jessup, Lindsay Lohe, Marlon Kuzmik, and especially our fearless leader, Pamela Pollock. Thank you, can we <laughs> celebrate them? They worked so hard to make us shine today, so thank you. Well, the Harvard Horizons Fellowship has not just help us, helped us to hone our public speaking skills, but we have developed the ability to communicate some of the nuances of our work in a succinct way. Now, how do you take years upon years of research, blood, sweat, and maybe even some tears, and pare all of that down to the short presentations that we experience today? Well, it's through 10 weeks of workshopping our scripts, dozens of hours editing presentation slides, it's building community amongst ourselves through intently listening and learning each other's work and providing feedback on each other's presentations, and it's practice, 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 memorization, and more practice, and then it's actually showing up, not running away, but showing up, fighting the butterflies and enjoying the moment. And now, I and my fellow Harvard Horizon scholars can breathe a sigh of relief. Let's all breathe. Because we have accomplished what few academics, academics have ever done. And that's describe our dissertation research in less than 10 minutes. <laughs> it has been a wild ride. It's been exciting. Thank you for being here in the culmination of this work. Now I'd like to invite all the Harvard Horizon Scholars uh, 2016 uh, uh, 16 on, on the stage. And Professor Hisa Kriyama. I'm going to sing. You can stand there. So I think it's a time for us to thank all the speakers, as well as all the people behind, to uh, make all this impossible again.
Now, normally this is a time that we will give our scholar their certificate, but because in the interest of time, we will move that portion to a private uh, ceremony because I know uh, many of you wanted to get out to uh, have, the, have a drink and uh, mingle with, uh, with the scholars. So before we do that, I do want to remind you for two things. First, definitely save whatever the notes you have and jog at this because 800 years from now will be which will be the Harvard University 1200th anniversary. At that time, your offspring will be able to sell this on eBay for enough money to uh, endow a chair in your honor. <laughs> Number two, that we will be offering lots of good drinks, got good food, but I want you to drink responsibly, that afterwards, if you need to drive, call Uber. So we want to make sure you can vote this year. Thank you very much, and I see you in Horizon 5.